Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you also for inviting me to come to this uh, wonderful celebration of 15 years of Cielo. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and also to have an opportunity um, to give you an indication of um, why the Academy of Science of South Africa decided that joining CLO would be a significant um, advance um, for the publication of scientific material in South Africa. Because as you can see, South Africa is, is rather distant from the other members of CLO. And you may be interested in finding out how it is um, that we ended up as part of CLO. And in addition to that, I would also like to um, give you an insight into the policy environment um, in South Africa, uh, which makes this a very important development. Now let me start first of all um, with some work which was done by the Academy of Science of South Africa. Um, the Academy produces um, scholarly reports which it provides to the government in order to give it advice. And early in uh, 2003, um, the departments of education and the Department of Science and Technology asked the Academy for some advice about the assessment of research publishing in South Africa. Because at that stage, there were some um, 250 uh, scholarly journals. Um, and the government was interested in what the quality of these locally produced scholarly journals were. So the Academy then put together a, uh, a panel um, which d investigated um, scholarly publishing in South Africa. And that panel's report was the one that was delivered in 2006. And you can see a photograph of the cover of it um, on, uh, in the top right-hand corner of the slide. Those of you who are interested in the um, contents of the report can download it from the um, website of the Academy. Um, and in that particular report, the Academy made a whole range of recommendations um, about the nature of scientific publishing in journals in South Africa. And they also uh, found out that there was a very wide range of quality of those journals and indicated to the government that the quality of the journals needed to be assessed. Uh, the second thing that the Academy did was it was also asked to do an assessment of scholarly book publishing in South Africa. And so in 2009, they completed the study of the scholarly book production and its use and evaluation in South Africa. And I'll come back in, in a moment in, as to why the government was interested in these evaluations. But I wanted to mention to you something about the key findings of the report on research publishing. And the key findings were some of the findings that you've been discussing over the last two days. First of all, it was quite clear that there was low visibility of the existing local journals in South Africa. Most of them were appearing in print, and the print copies had a very low circulation. And very few of them were actually included in the prominent international journal indices. Um, in fact, of the 250, only 40 appear in the um, international journal indices. The rest do not. Um, and so this was a key barrier to enhancing the quality of these journals. Um, and it was a question of not only enhancing the quality of the journals, but also improving their visibility um, so that the impact of the work that was being done by the researchers in South Africa would have a much more uh, or much larger international footprint. And as a consequence of that report, the Academy then developed a um, committee on scholarly publishing and also established within the Academy 
a scholarly publishing unit, um, which is headed by Susan Feltzman, um, who is here at the meeting um, with us. And she will be talking about uh, CLO South Africa on Friday morning. But essentially, the scholarly publishing unit um, set up a number of different uh, subdivisions. The first was the Nat National Scholarly Journal Editors Forum, because there hadn't been an editors forum in the country before that. And so the editors forum was crucial for getting the editors together to address the issues of what was going to happen to the journals in the future. We also established a National Scholarly Book Publishers Forum um, because the book publishers were also grappling with the issue of whether they should go um, to um, open access to book publishing as well. And, and then the, the unit also established an open access pla platform which has become known now as CLO South Africa and I'll say more about that in a moment. And the, this unit also is doing two other things. The first is it is now undertaking a discipline group peer review of the journals um, which are published in South Africa. And I'll tell you why that, that's important in a moment because it has to do with policy development. And then of course it also offers online scientific writing courses for authors. Now, the, the key question for South African journals, and it's the same key question that you grapple with, and, and that is how to get global open access to the quality local journals in South Africa. And in order to achieve this, the Academy established a task team. And the task team had the, uh, the job of determining what were the possible national platforms for open access publishing um, that South Africa could use. And this task team was led by Wieland Gervers, um, and Wieland Gervers is essentially the godfather of open access in South Africa. And as part of that investigation, he visited CLO Brazil um, in June 2008. So you can see it was at an early stage in the development of CLO. But as a result of that investigation, um, the task team concluded that Cielo, which was started in Brazil, would best achieve the purpose that South Africa saw uh, for establishing open access journals. And as a consequence of that, started negotiations um, to become members of Cielo. So the history of CLO South Africa then is that following that task team visit in 2008, um, a pilot was established in the middle of 2009, and that pilot had seven titles. Uh, CLO Brazil hosted the platform and did all of the e-publications, including the markup of the articles. Now, as this uh, process of engagement continued over the years, the Academy started doing more and more of the markup of the articles itself uh, between 2010 and 2011. And then, of course, the Academy took over all of the uh, functions um, of the platform um, for its collection in 2012. So there has been a, a process whereby Cielo Brazil essentially has incubated a platform for South Africa, which has now, after a period of time, um, moved to the point um, of being able to operate independently. So rather than being 15 years old, uh, this platform is a, a approximately three years old. So we're just moving out of the stage of being toddlers. Um, I would also like to thank um, Cielo Brazil for the training opportunities that they offered um, to the members of staff of the scholarly publishing unit. Um, the initial um, training took place here in Brazil, and you can see those top two photographs give an indication of the team from South Africa and the team from Cielo Brazil undertaking the training here in Sao Paulo. 
Um, then, of course, as the uh, processes started being taken over um, in the offices of Cielo South Africa in Pretoria, uh, the team from Brazil paid a visit and assisted the team in South Africa with the development um, of the IT infrastructure and the capacity to actually um, undertake the work of putting the journals onto the platform. So that gives you a, a, a brief history of the way in which South Africa became involved um, in CLO. Now what I would like to do is to just give you an insight into the policy environment in South Africa which was actually driving these developments. First of all, the Department of Higher Education and Training in South Africa is responsible for funding all public higher education institutions. And what they did was they introduced what was called a research incentive scheme for universities in 2003. And the mechanism that they used to distribute these incentives was simply to look at the number of publications that the universities produced and then uh, pay the universities an incentive for each publication. And so what they were doing is they were directly funding research publication outputs via what they called publication units. And if anybody is interested in this, I can explain it to you afterwards. It's somewhat complicated. But essentially what it boils down to is they were paying of the order of about $12,000 per unit. Um, of publication. And what this meant, of course, was that the universities were getting a stream of income um, which was based on their productivity. And they could use that stream of income um, to support their research activities. Uh, the second aspect of this policy environment relates to the Department of Science and Technology. And the, de the Department of Science and Technology is responsible for the national Research Foundation. And essentially what the National Research Foundation does is it is somewhat similar to FAPESP, for um, and that is that it funds individual research scholars. Um, and so on the one hand, um, the Department of Higher Education is funding outputs of the research system, whereas the Department of Science and Technology is funding the inputs into the research uh, system um, by the funding of scholars through the National Research Foundation. I also thought I would just give you a very brief overview of the current state of um, South African publications and also some of the impacts that these um, uh, incentives have had on those publications. If you look at the uh, diagram on the left-hand side, that is the um, total production of publications which are listed in the web of science. And one of the things you will see is that there's an interesting, interesting inflection, inflection point in this graph just after 2003, which, is which may be related to the fact of the introduction of the incentive scheme for the production of research publications. And what you can see is um, that the, the actual production of publications which are listed in Web of Science, which is not the total production, of course, um, has been growing substantially over that period of time and continues to grow uh, beyond 2012. Then on, on the right-hand side diagram, what I've shown you there is the percentage of the world share of publications in the web of science um, which comes from South Africa over the period from 2003 to 2012 and what you can see there is it's grown from about half a percent to just over 0.7 percent of the world's publication in that period of time um, and I think that's a significant um, growth in um, uh, the share of the world's publications for a very small science system. Uh, just by way of comparison, uh, the Chinese share of the world system is about 6%. All right, let's move on. Uh, uh, I'm going... Oops. 
Let me just go on then to give you an indication of what the impact of these research reports of the Academy were. Um, both of the departments of government, that's the Department of Higher Education and the Department of Science and Technology, endorsed the reports on scholarly publishing and asked the Academy to implement the recommendations. The Department of Science and Technology supported and funded the extension to South Africa of the Sayolo e-publishing platform. So in other words, there is sig significant support for this. Um, and so Cielo South Africa then is seen as the, the open access platform for a group of journals um, which are produced in South Africa. And at the moment, it's a selected group of uh, peer-reviewed journals which are allowed to go onto the platform. And of course, it's an integral part um, of the project which we've been discussing at this conference. Five minutes. Okay. Let me just talk briefly now about uh, the discipline group peer review panels for journals. Because the question is how are journals going to be recognized for being part of this panel? And let me just give you a little bit more information about the policy environment. Um, on the 1st of February of this year, the Department of Higher Education published a new policy. Um, and the policy covers uh, full-length peer-reviewed journal articles. It covers books and chapters in books. And it also covers conference proceedings. And it mandates the academy to actually evaluate um, all of these um, for the recognition of that funding incentive. Now, it's, it's very useful, of course, for governments to assist you in this way uh, by creating policies. Um, but as we heard earlier this morning, this field is moving extremely rapidly. And one of the things that concerns me is that the policy legislative process moves much more slowly. So there's a strong risk that this kind of policy development may actually lock into place uh, a set of um, principles which in the future may not be advantageous. So I think that the, both the Academy and the CLO platform have a very important function to play in advising government about the development of policies as the publishing processes change over time. Now, what, what this policy makes provision for is the recognition of papers which appear on three lists. That's the ISI, the IBSS, and the list of South African journals. And the list of South African journals is one which has to be quality assured by the Academy of Science. And so what happens is that the Academy panels undertake peer review of the journals so that they can be considered for inclusion in the South African list. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you will see two of the uh, peer review reports that have already been published, um, one on journals related to agriculture and the related life sciences, and another one on the social sciences. And currently, um, the, uh, and currently what is happening is that the Academy is reviewing journals in a range of additional fields. Let me just bring you up to date on the status for CLO South Africa at the moment. It has now been certified um, as an independent collection. We currently have 28 journals on the collection. Um, and what the uh, scholarly publishing unit is doing is it is now um, reviewing uh, groups of disciplines in the fields of religion and in theology in health sciences and related medical sciences, in law and related legal fields, and also in the humanities. And so all of these fields of uh, which journals which are publishing in those fields will be reviewed. And if the review is possible positive, then they could potentially join the, um, the platform. Um, let's so here, here you see the uh, official launch and certification of the 
CLO South Africa. On the left-hand side is the uh, advisor to the Minister of Science and Technology, Kotso Mokele. Uh, then there's Susan Feltzman, who leads the unit in South Africa. Uh, Daya Reddy, who is the president of the Academy of Science. And then, of course, the person on the right is well known to all of us. And it, we're delighted to have him as our guest uh, for the certification function. Now, I, I just want to make one or two final remarks in, in closing off. Um, as, you, as you've heard from the previous speaker, um, and also if you look at the USA, the UK, and the European Union, granting agencies and some grant funders are developing um, policies to make open access mandatory for the research that they fund. And I think that's a position which all of us support. And in most of the cases, what they're doing is the funds are made available in grants for this purpose. Um, in South Africa, the situation is somewhat different. There are 12 institutions uh, which have signed the Berlin Declaration on Open Access, and all of those are institutions. They're universities and science councils. As far as the, as, as far as the government is concerned, there's no established government policy um, on open access publication. And the uh, government has been somewhat reluctant to move into this area because they've had a major drive on um, uh, protecting intellectual property. And the, the significant misconception which is um, influencing uh, this in South Africa is, an in, is the misconception that uh, some way in, or other open access is going to impact um, on the protection of intellectual property. And I think that we have a significant amount of work to do to point out that, that, that open access is simply an alternative form of publication and is no different from publication in the print media and the mechanisms that are used to protect intellectual property before publication apply equally to both forms of publication. But I think that that has been a significant uh, stumbling block to the development of a, a government open access policy. And in fact, currently, uh, the Medical Research Council is the only research council that allows their grants to be used for open access publications. The, the other granting agencies don't allow that. Um, and then the, the final slide that I have is, is related to the um, interesting study that was John, done by John Bohannon um, for science, in which he found um, that a large number of open access journals um, accepted papers which he described as scientific nonsense. Um, now, I think that it's very clear uh, from the methodology that he used, um, that there were was, there was some significant deficiencies in peer review in the journals that actually accepted those papers. But it doesn't say anything at all about the open access form of publication. What it does indicate quite clearly is that the, the question that has been recurring over the last two days about the quality assurance uh, for the material um, that needs to be published is really very significantly underlined by the study. And I think that as with paper-based journals, the quality of the reviewing process is the key to the credibility of those journals. And I think that as far as CLO South Africa is concerned, um, we, uh, we will ensure that the journals that go onto, those, onto that platform uh, adhere to all the, the, the highest forms of quality assurance um, in the acceptance of the papers that they published. Thank you very much. <laughs>